Hello, I'm Pastor Adil DePano, lead pastor of First United Methodist Church of Pasadena. I would like to thank you for watching the rebroadcast of our Sunday worship services and wish you would join us in our Sunday lineup of activities beginning with adult and children's Sunday school at 9, worship service at 10, and youth ministries at 5.30. We are a reconciling congregation that welcomes all persons. Come and be part of our vibrant community that seeks to serve God as faithfully and fruitfully as we can. God bless you. Christ conquereth, Christ reigneth, Christ ruleth. So what? What do we do with that message? Southern Baptist consultant Robert Dale has recently diagnosed one of the 21st century church's most pervasive afflictions, and he names it Intention Deficit Disorder. IDD exists in two forms. First, there are those churches that simply don't have any clear intentions, any definable understandings of who they are or what they are doing. Their only real intention is to continue to meet Sunday after Sunday, balance the budget, keep the building in good repair, and put on a good Christmas pageant. The lack of any intention for ministry or ministry outside the walls of these churches is glaringly obvious. But there is a second type of intention deficit disorder that is often overlooked. It is sometimes even misdiagnosed as compassion, commitment, or concern. In these IDD churches, there appear to be many good intentions. They conduct numerous polls and continually canvass members to make sure they are offering programs and providing services that are pleasing to their members. They open their doors to the community, offering the church building as a meeting place for neighborhood groups, educational services, or musical events. This type of IDD church might perceive itself as a youth-oriented church and give all its services, programs, and staff members a facelift. IDD churches may see themselves as great preaching churches, tailoring their identity around that of a commanding preacher's voice. Each one of these intentions is admirable, but a church that is caught up in only accomplishing a list of intentions, good intentions, is still suffering a severe deficit. Good intentions are not enough. The fact is that the church exists to accomplish one basic intention, and that is obeying God and God's mandates. Just as the intention of the church cannot be mere survival, Neither can the intention of the church be to tailor its presence in order to please everybody. It is not the intention of the church to make its membership happy. It is not the intention of the church to make its home community happy. It is not the intention of the church to make its pastor happy. 
It is not the intention of the church to make its youth happy. It is not the intention of the church to make its choir happy, but we'll give them some slack. (laughs) But it is the intention of the church to make God happy. Do I hear an amen? amen? Whatever its good intentions, the true intention of the church is not to bring happiness. We talked a little bit about this last Sunday. The intent of the church is to be obedient to God. Sustained obedience to God, to God's commands and concerns, is what enables the church to be the church. No matter what other intentions any particular congregations may seek to embody, they must first remain committed to God's authority and to the mission God has called the church to serve. Today's reading from the book of Acts takes us inside the chambers of the high priest and the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were elitists who wanted to maintain the priestly caste. The Sadducees, for one, insisted on on a literal interpretation of the written law. And consequently, they they did not believe in the resurrection, since it is not mentioned in the Torah. The main focus of Sadducee life was rituals associated with the temple. Before the high priest and Sadducees were Peter and the apostles, who had just miraculously escaped from prison the night before and were rearrested the following day as they were teaching in the temple. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, bellowed the high priest from his seat of authority. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than human authority. The book of Acts is no less than a missionary journal, recalling how the the apostles obeyed God's mandate upon their lives, preaching the gospel, forming the church, and tirelessly working to spread the good news, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. The book of Acts records how the apostles lived out Christ's directive that the disciples will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1, verse 8. Definitely no intention deficit disorder there among Jesus' disciples especially after his resurrection. Christ conquereth, Christ reigneth, Christ ruleth. And they did something about that message. What does it mean to be witnesses to Jesus Christ? Well, for starters, they, as well as we today, have to accept the fact it wouldn't be easy. The enemies of Jesus Christ killed him. What do you think they'll do to his followers? Give them a free pass? Tolerate them? Or give them hell? Just like 
they did to their leader. If you're a follower of Jesus, accept that it won't be easy. It won't be nice all the time. Witnessing to our faith in the risen Christ won't be a cakewalk, especially if we intentionally take it outside of our immediate faith community. At least one of our children is, is uh, honest enough to say, oh, it's, 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 it's not that challenging to talk about Jesus. I go to a Christian school. We do it all the time. But taking this message out of our immediate community, it's going to be hard. It won't be easy. Followers of Jesus today need to remember the Great Commission's dual foci. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, meaning within our own faith community or, or within our own comfort zone, as well as in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, meaning the larger community outside of ours. Our upcoming Loaf and Fish Fest on April 26th is a good opportunity to be clear about these two foci. In the words of our evangelism and hospitality chair, David Beach, and I didn't get to call him before quoting this today. David, uh, forgive me. He said, it's awesome to have everyone involved, but we also have to remember to tell our non-FUMC friends this is going on. This isn't for us. It's for the community to find out about us. And I might add, for the community to find out about our faith, to find out what we do on account of this faith. We need all of us to market and promote FUMC, who we are, what we care about, and do on account of our faith. We are witnesses to Jesus, no less. A witness is of no use if he or she is not willing to take the stand or share what he or she has witnessed to be true. A poll of more than 2,000 Americans commissioned by, by the Atlantic and the Aspen Institute for the Aspen Ideas Festival and conducted by Penn uh, Schoen Berland between May 25 and, and June 6 of last year shows that overall, 89% of Americans now say that they believe in God down from 98% in a 1967 Gallup poll. The youngest generation shows an even sharper decline to 81%, though people often become more religious after they have children or start a family. But by all measures, from basic belief to weekly attendance, religion and religious life are trending down in importance in American life. It is not going to be a cakewalk. What does it mean when we say we believe in God? Or to say, like Peter, we must obey God rather than human authority? At this first confrontation, with Jesus' followers, the Sadducees had professed strong theological differences with the apostles. As Sadducees, and as I've already said, rejected all notions 
of the resurrection, which of course was the crux of the apostles' good news. With the images of the crucifixion and resurrection still fresh in our minds, the Reverend Ignacio Castuera suggests followers of Jesus have a responsibility to take the next step of asking the question, who today represent those who are being crucified or hung on a tree or who are hanging on to trees for dear life, whom followers of Jesus ought to be concerned about, or better still, be doing something about? Without taking the resurrection beyond the pages of Scripture, what good is it to us or anyone? Perhaps our nation's ex most experienced investor and America's most uh, second wealthiest man, uh, Warren Buffett, says uh, this is his favorite riddle. Question, how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? Answer, answer, four. Because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Good intentions aren't good if they don't do any good. Good and right intentions can sometimes be muddled by what the Garrison Keeler describes as woofing. I, I learned a new word, woofing. I guess it's street jargon for someone who is all talk and no action, someone who says he or she is going to do something and does not do it. So is that person called a woofer? He writes, to know and to serve God, of course, is why we're here. A clear truth that, like the nose on your face, is near at hand and easily discernible, but can make you dizzy if you try to focus on it hard. But a little faith will see you through. When the country goes temporarily to the dogs, cats must learn to be circumspect, walk on fences, sleep in trees, and have faith that all this woofing is not the last word. What is the last word then? Gentleness is everywhere in daily life, a sign that faith rules through ordinary things, through cooking and small talk, through storytelling, making love, fishing, tending animals and sweet corn, and flowers, through sports, music, and books, raising kids, all the pla I love this line, all the places where the gravy soaks in and grace shines through. Church, where are those places today where the gravy of God's goodness needs to soak in and divine grace to shine through. Where are those places? It's up to us Easter people to witness to the resurrection power of God in and through our lives. Good intentions aren't good enough if they're no good to anyone. Amen.